The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, it wasn't that long ago when Chinese domestic politics really didn't have much of an impact outside of China, particularly in places like Africa. But today, now, more and more, given China's deepening and broadening engagement across Africa, people are closely watching what happens in a number of domestic political events here in China, particularly what's happening in Beijing. And most recently, there was a very important political event called the Two Sessions. Why don't you talk us through a little bit as to what Two Sessions was and why it was important, particularly in an African context? The two sessions is generally not particularly exciting in and of themselves. They're these the regular kind of big meetings. One is of the National People's Congress, which is essentially the legislature or the parliament of China, which is officially the most powerful state organ, but is generally seen as basically approving whichever decisions were made in the party. And then the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which is the most powerful political advisory body in China, which is akin to something like the House of Lords or the U.S. Senate. So they both had big meetings recently. They mostly drew a lot of attention because they essentially approved the Chinese Communist Party's decision to remove term limits. So they essentially rubber stamped the decision that would allow uh, President Xi Jinping to stay in power for longer than two terms. Term um, that, that's an important point, and uh, let's just kind of spend a little bit of time talking about this because there may be some implications for Africa as well. So from 1982, China had a two-term limit, and they were each term was five years. So really, since 1982, China has had a remarkable transfer of power every 10 years. And what that did was it allowed for a kind of a cleansing of the system, whereas every 10 years, a new generation of leaders would come in and the system would refresh itself. And for a non-democratic authoritarian government, this was always considered quite remarkable and quite impressive with the predictability of the transfer of power. And in part, they wanted to avoid the excesses of the Mao era when Mao Zedong ruled China for decades without any any check on his power and any term limits of any kind. So now Xi Jinping has amassed enough power for him to change the constitution and he is leading for life. This, of course, is the implications for Africa is not necessarily that good where we have seen some concerns about the rollback of democracy and transfers of power there as well. So, Kobus, I just wanted to kind of highlight that because that was really one of the big takeaways from the two sessions. But you recently published an op-ed and a paper for SIA, for the South African Institute of International Affairs, that detailed five key takeaways that might be relevant for Africa. Why don't you walk us through those five key takeaways that you think might be germane for the continent? So these are five big trends that I identified from the 19th Party Congress, which was late last year, through the two sessions and by drawing a lot on Xi Jinping's own writing. So Xi Jinping, (laughs) like, writes a lot. And the Chinese government put out the very, very, like, lushly bound two big fat volumes of his writings. And so I worked my way through them. And these are just, like, big trends that I read from tea leaves, basically, in relation to Africa. So the five that... As Africa keeps dealing with China, they're increasingly going to be also dealing with the Chinese Communist Party. Now, of course, this has been true forever, but it's becoming especially true now. Like this, you know, the merging of the state with the party where you really can't really see the, you know, kind of the lines between the two, I think has been entrenched a lot under Xi. So whatever Africa is doing with China, it's going to be doing it via the Chinese Communist Party. Second one is that the Belt and Road Initiative is here to stay. You know, it it was kind of flavor of the month for a long time. You know, it's been really entrenched now. And and because it is Xi Jinping's crowning achievement or like kind of the jewel of the crown of his development planning, I I think, you know, it's going to become the template through which a lot of foreign policy and development is developed now. Third one. I looked at is that that China is probably will probably be uh, supportive of African efforts to reform the UN, especially to reform the UN Security Council. 
Like this goes back a long time. So this isn't new. China has been supporting the idea that there should be African countries on the UN Security Council for a while. And of course, Africa has been pushing that for a long time. So, you know, it looks like judging by she's writing, you know, it seems like China might be, they might not actively advocate for that, but they wouldn't be opposing it. The fourth one is that China will increase its global military role. And we've been seeing that anyway, you know, especially because of the military base in Djibouti and enhanced peacekeeping. But she has repeatedly made the point that China should expand its military and that that military should be combat ready. And, you know, so with the base in Africa, that becomes part of Africa's story. And finally, it's said over and over and over, and, you know, it's been confirmed by the two sessions that they plan to have an even stronger hand on the internet than they did before. And why this is interesting for Africa is because it's increasingly being put under the theme of internet sovereignty, which is the idea that instead of having a global internet service, each country's internet should be run by that country's national government which obviously China is very much for, and you can see for both commercial and political reasons why. But there are increasingly also African leaders picking up on that theme. So those are the five key trends. Those are that I five look. key. The, okay, so five takeaways from you from the 19th Party Congress and the two sessions. One other very big event that came out of the two sessions that I think is very, very relevant for Africa is the creation of an aid agency very much in the model of what DFID does in the United Kingdom and what USAID does in the United States, China will now have its first overseas development agency, which it's never had before up until now that was run out of the Ministry of Commerce. So that was a very big development that came out of two sessions as well. And again, in China, there is not a democratic process where the legislature behaves similar to what Western legislatures or even African legislatures do. It is very much a rubber stamp, but it does still play an important role. And so we can't simply dismiss it. And that's why we're thrilled to have Nsetse Ware back on the show again. And Nsetse, for longtime followers of our program, has been a regular guest of ours over the years. She's an international economist based in Nairobi, Kenya. And recently, she wrote an article for the, the business or a column for the Kenyan newspaper Business Daily, Shifts in China, Africa Should Watch, where she details three really important shifts that came out of two sessions. And Setse, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. I'm glad to be back. Well, fantastic. Well, let's spend the next 15 minutes kind of walking through the three points and we'll go one by one. The first one you talk about is socialism with Chinese characteristics. Why is that important for Africa to follow? Well, I think it's the first time that many Africans, particularly of my age, have seen an articulation of Chinese ideology in such a strong manner. This is obviously a speech that Xi Jinping delivered in October last year, sort of outlining the new sort of socialism, with Chinese characteristics that will be guiding activity um, going forward. So I think for a lot of us, it's the first time we've seen China have an ideological position that they're detailing for the world to see and to say, listen, this is our ideological position. So that for me was very new. It was also, you know, just following up on that, I would also say that what was interesting for me was that it was then also promoted very aggressively by Chinese embassies in Africa. And so the Chinese embassy in Pretoria, like, held a large events, kind of where they flew some of the people, including some of the people who translated these writings, they flew out to Pretoria. And they had kind of these kind of big events where they really like went into detail on what Chinese, like socialism with Chinese characteristics would mean for Africa. So they really promoted it. And they say in the article, you make the point that you think there might be a chance that that China might be more interested in exporting that system to other countries. No, absolutely. If you read that speech... One of the points Xi Jinping is making is saying that China needs to have influence in the realm of ideology. And I think it's this coming of age that both of you have been alluding to around China beginning to understand that it has power. And so far, they really just focused on their economic power and making sure they become economically dominant. But of course, what we're seeing now is that they're beginning to have a stronger presence in terms of military power, but also we're beginning to say a stronger presence in ideological power. And this has been very, very new because if you look at the commentary on Sino-African relations, it's really been dominated by this xenophobic Euro-American commentary around China's out to exploit and destroy Africa. And we've seen that transition in Euro-American ideology. First they said, oh, China is here to colonialize you and be imperialist. Then they shifted to, oh, China is here to take all your raw materials. And now the big xenophobic narrative is China is saddling Africa with debt and Africa is going to be under the foot of China. 
So I think one of the things Z is trying to do is to say, listen, we have an ideology. We have the right to say that there is an alternative way to govern nations. There is an alternative way for economic development to happen. There is an alternative in terms of alleviating poverty, creating wealth. And there is a model that works, and it is a valid model. They are no longer being neutral about this. And I think they're being very clear that we have an alternative that the world should look at and that we will share with the world to let the world know that the European and American model of development is not the only way. There is another model, and we have shown that it works. So that, to me, was one of the big things that the two sessions and sort of the lead-up was, is, is China is beginning to have an ideological position that they are promoting globally. And, of course, Africa will be very important to that because Africa is quite young in terms of ideological development. Obviously, Africa is quite young in terms of economic development. So I think if you look at where that ideological thrust will naturally sit globally, Africa will be a key target in China exporting that ideology and model in terms of proving to the world that there's more than one way of developing. So that may be the case, but I think so often when we discuss this within an African context, people put it through the lens of their own experience, which is the imperialism and colonialism of the pre-20th century in Africa done by the Europeans. I don't think that the Chinese will follow a similar path. Instead, where I think they're going to go with this in terms of how they bring this ideology to Africa, and Nsetse, I'd like to get your take on this, is following kind of their own historical instincts. Howard French, and I've referred to this book several times already on the, I just finished his latest book where he talks about the tributary state and the history of tributary states in China and around Asia, and that the way that the Chinese exacted power over other countries was through leverage. And he talks about this, that they gained the mandate of heaven, the emperors in China, by virtue of the fact that they were able to have significantly disproportionate trading relationships with countries like Vietnam, Korea, Japan, and that gave them power. And I see the same trend and dynamic happening with countries like Uganda and Ghana, and even to some extent with Kenya as well. And through that imbalance in power in the, in the economic relationship, they are then able to apply pressure in political and ideological context as well. So I'd like to talk about how we maybe link the debt question, the trade question, and the ideology all together. Well, I think they have to be smarter than that, and I think they will be. It's precisely because... Africa has had this awful experience with Europe and North America in terms of colonialism and then in terms of debt and sort of continued sort of involvement and interference with our social political and geopolitical interests, that China must be very careful. What we're trying to tell China right now is that, listen, you have to show us that you're not like Europe and North America. You have to show us that you will not be in a position where your interests trump ours. OK, so one of the big ways we're going to be testing China to see its commitment to creating an ideological thrust in Africa that is mutually, genuinely mutually beneficial. One of the key ways we're going to see that is whether they really support the industrialization of the continent. Because right now, where we are playing with China commercially and in trade is still a raw materials supporter. We're still just support, um, exporting raw commodities. So one of the big things that we want to see is, will China be different? and shift a lot of manufacturing capacity from China into Africa and help support the industrialization of the continent that a lot of African leaders are really into right now. So China is in a very difficult position because we've been down this road before where people have power, they exploit Africa, and Africa gets nothing. So I think you will find a lot more pushback from Africa around how China actually iterates and moves forward in the continent. I want to return a little bit to, to your previous point about the exporting of ideology. You know, in your explanation of it, you, you referred a lot to China's development model. And I do agree that to a large extent, you know, China's development model is being exported. You know, the way that, that special economic zones, for example, are being, you know, kind of exported to Ethiopia. But do you also see the exporting of actual ideology? I mean, do you see that is a push for socialism with Chinese characteristics to be incorporated into African systems? Because that I don't really see. Like I see that kind of like authoritarian centralized development system, that maybe. But in terms of the actual ideology, I'm not so sure. Well, I think there are two things. One, I think it's early days. I think this is a very new strategy, and I think they're still trying to figure out how they're going to deploy it. So that's one thing. This is still very early days. We don't really know how that will be articulated over the next five or ten years. That's one point. I think the second point is that China knows that Africa has had bad experiences with authoritarianism. China also knows, the third point, is that democracy has been sold to Africa so aggressively for like the past 50 years that it will be very difficult 
for Africans to get on board an authoritarian sort of structure as a continent. There may be pockets of authoritarianism on the continent, but I think China knows that this really aggressive democratic narrative that's really been targeted at Africa for decades now will be very difficult to overcome. So I don't think that ideological shift is happening. But what's happening also is that we're beginning to see that China is not good at communication. And I think this is something that is being raised right now around how does China better communicate its ideas? Obviously, there's a language problem, which is a big issue, but we've seen Chinese documents both by academia and government are being translated into English. But the reality is that China is not good at communicating and branding itself, okay? If you look at Europe and North America, whether they brand themselves as USAID or DFID, they have a very definite brand and a very definite communication strategy that supports that brand. I don't think China is there yet. So I think there will be some time before we see a sophisticated, calm strategy linked with an ideological message that targets Africa. But I think that is in the works, in my view. But as I said, it's still early days yet. Kobus, let me try and disagree with you here a little bit, where you say that the Chinese have not been exporting their model. And I'd like to kind of stay in your backyard here in South Africa, because in so many ways, it seems like the ANC has either tried to draw inspiration from what the Chinese Communist Party has done, where the state and the party have fused together, both in the name of consolidating power of the party, but also making the party dominant over the state, which is the case here in China, but something that certainly Jacob Zuma was trying to do with the ANC in South Africa. And the idea that China was helping South Africa and the ANC set up a training academy similar to the Communist Party Training Academy in Beijing, where the next generation of elite leaders is developed, that to me seems like the exporting of, if not an ideology, but certainly a system. Ethiopia seems to have drawn quite a bit of influence from China's model. Paul Kagame may not be modeling himself on the Chinese, but he's certainly drawing some influence as an authoritarian leader. And Paul Bia in Cameroon is indicating that he too may not want to give up power and stay in office for life. So is this a direct exportation? I don't know, but it seems to be coincidence that a lot of these things are happening as China's influence on the continent remains quite high. What's your take on that? The South African case, I think it might be a little bit more correlation than causation in the sense that, yeah, like definitely there is some training happening, but the merging of the party and the state, I think that comes already from the aspects of South Africa's democratic changeover. I don't think it started with Zuma. I think it already it was kind of in the works already earlier, you know, in the Mbeki era and probably in the Mandela era already. So I think in that sense, it's for me, it's less that South Africa is taking over China's model and more that South Africa and China have very similar political cultures, you know, in the sense that, you know, the South African Communist Party is one of the oldest in the world. And so that kind of party culture, I think, is something that both South Africa and China has lived with for a long time. And so I think it puts them kind of on the same page. So the point that I was making, or one of the points that I was making in the op-ed was that, you know, China does a lot of training of African officials, politicians. There's thousands of African politicians that go to China for all kinds of different kinds of capacity building and training. And I'm not saying that they are being kind of brainwashed in kind of party kind of ideology, but one of the things that Xi Jinping has been very strong on has been to put the party back in the center of all training happening in China. So, you know, there's already from 2013, there's been these government directives going out, like warning, you know, academics against a certain bunch of quote unquote Western ideas that shouldn't be in the core of the curricula that they teach at university. So rather than China, you know, kind of exporting values, what is, I think, happening is that China is pulling in lots of people to be trained, but the training that's happening is happening explicitly within a Communist Party frame. And let's let's not forget also on that training point that more African students are studying in China than any other country in the world. And that, too, may not be in political ideology, but it certainly will have an impact. And Setsi, what do you have to say? I think what I have to say is that China is very subtle, okay? 
And it's really through Xi Jinping now that they are growing into this international power that wants to be recognized and that wants to let the world know we have power, we have influence, and we're going to use it to promote the interests of ourselves and our friends and our allies. And I think that's very important. So I think the subtlety with which China has been exerting influence on Africa ideologically has not been overt in the way that Europe and North America do it, where they're very loud and give us lectures about democracy and governance. China doesn't do that. They're very subtle. They do what Kobus was alluding to. They train a lot of us. They get a lot of our kids to go to school there. And they really influence us in a way that Africans themselves will be carrying that message to their countries rather than Chinese people coming in and doing it sort of through lectures and, and that sort of patronizing down talk that we get from other countries. I think the other thing that's going on with China is that they're beginning to understand that they need to have a counter narrative, okay? This xenophobic narrative that Europe and North America have been pushing on the African continent with the support of many African intellectuals, mind you, because Europe and North America have been very good at financing our think tanks, very important in financing our think tanks. And with that financing comes a certain ideological thrust. And so one of the things that will be interesting to see going forward is how China is going to craft a counter narrative that one, the commentary about Africa and China comes from Africa itself and comes from China and creates a robust counter narrative, is proactive, not reactive, and creates a body of knowledge that counters what Europe and North America are sort of pushing towards Africa and the world. So these are very interesting times in terms of the coming of age of China becoming understanding that mental power is where the battles are fought ideological spaces is where the battles are fought and they're beginning to understand soft power a lot more support for this podcast comes from the africa china reporting project at wit university school of journalism in johannesburg the acrp provides reporting grants workshops and other professional development opportunities for both african and chinese journalists follow the acrp on twitter at Vits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. Okay, well, let's move on to your second point. And in order to understand your second point, we really have to emphasize that the key hallmark of the Xi Jinping era has been a crackdown on corruption. For those of you not following Chinese politics, it cannot be overstated that Xi Jinping came into power and right away took off the head of Zhou Yongkong, who was then the head of internal security. And they really classify in China two categories of officials. There's the tigers and then the flies. And the tigers are the big fish, if you will, to mix my metaphors here. And he has not been afraid to go after both the tigers and the flies. And part of what came out of the two sessions recently was a new anti-corruption agency that will again strengthen Xi Jinping's crackdown against corruption. Some people say he's just going after his political opponents, but considering the breadth of the crackdown, it's extended far beyond just Xi Jinping's political opponents to extend across the society. And it's had a profound impact here in China with a lot of public support, given the pervasiveness of corruption and the frustration that people have. That is definitely something, and said say, that people can relate to in Africa, given the frustrations that so many people have with corruption there. That's right. And I think just to preface this is that we need to understand that one of the reasons perhaps Xi Jinping went for extending the limit is so that he can continue the crackdown without being pestered by opponents or him getting out of power and sort of that revenge coming to him in an ugly way. I was talking to some Chinese people here. They're saying that may be something that informed it. But I found it very interesting that he decided to change the law rather than sit on illegally, which I think is a subtlety people haven't necessarily picked up on. But yes, corruption is a big issue in Africa. And one of the things we want to see is what powers will that corruption body be given and who else will they take down and what will be the consequences for corruption? Because in Kenya, for example, our anti-corruption agency has no teeth whatsoever. We have not seen any high profile people being brought down. We certainly have not seen people being punished, either in terms of fines or jail time. So one of the things we're really watching is what will the powers be and what will the consequences be? And I think that is a very important narrative that China can bring to the continent in a manner that will improve its brand and improve its image. And I think that's one of the things Xi Jinping is very intelligent about. He understands brand China. He knows brand China has good sides and he knows brand China has bad sides. And one of the bad sides 
of brand China is this corruption question. So he's saying, let's clean up brand China so that we're stronger internally and so that we can exert more influence externally. That's one. And then, of course, I'm just alluding to the last point, the other big anti-China brand China that's negative is the environmental question. So again, we're seeing that shift under Z. So I'm really seeing Xi Jinping bringing out the strategy and he's really playing the long game. There will be short term nuisances and pains that will happen to him even personally. But I think he's really trying to create a brand of China that is really quite secure and airtight. Yeah, I was wondering how you think the anti-corruption theme will play in Africa. My idea, you know, looking from South Africa, you know, South Africa has gone through a lot of corruption during the Zuma era. And now, you know, there seems to be a move towards, well, there's, it's been announced that Jacob Zuma will actually be facing charges for corruption. So we'll see how this develops. But, you know, South Africa has gone through a kind of a national crisis about corruption. And, uh, you know, not only a crisis in South African politics, but also a crisis in South African self-image, where, where South Africans started to think of South Africa as being a very, very corrupt place. And I think with that comes the idea that if you can really crack down on corruption, then many Africans might be willing to accept a more authoritarian government if that government can show that it is really cracking down on corruption. So do you see that that aspect, that kind of authoritarianism plus less corruption system that Xi Jinping is, you know, kind of now the figurehead of, do you think that logic could play well in parts of Africa? I think absolutely. I think if we get a clean government that delivers service to the people, I don't think people will be too bothered about it. But we need to know that there'll be a very strong uh, push against that by Europe and North America, who have very deep roots from government down to the grassroots. They have an extensive network from government bodies, think tanks, NGOs, funding, foundations. So there'll be a very strong thrust against that sort of thing. But I think the first way China can really begin to tackle the corruption question in Africa is through all the debt that they've given Africa. So one of the issues that came up during the conversations we were having in two sessions with some colleagues was Africa and China debt to Africa. And of course, your American narrative has been, oh, China is pushing all this debt on Africa. But of course, if you study Africa, you know that's not true. A lot of the appetite of debt is coming from African governments and we get it from different sources. And if China is willing to give African governments those money, they will take it. So I think where we are now, we're in a very precarious position where we do owe a lot to China. China can definitely use that as an anti-corruption tool, not by lecturing Africans, but just saying, listen, there's some fiscal transparency and fiscal discipline um, rules that we want you to observe while you're using our money. Because that will serve two purposes. One, it will make sure Africans can pay back the money to China. I don't think China wants to lose billions to the continent. So I think just from a pragmatic point of view, that's one thing. But secondly, it will also start to tackle the corruption question where fiscal policy is opaque in many African countries, where the use of funds is opaque. So if China can start to create a narrative of fiscal discipline and fiscal transparency is in the interest of African people, then there will be a lot of buy-in, I think, from Africans and saying, let's make sure that at least the money we get from China, that money will be used properly. The other money, the other partners can decide what they want to do with it. So I think while it's a, a bit of a, a burden right now in terms of the debt and the scale of debt, it provides a really good opportunity for China to come in and say, we need to be responsible in terms of how we manage this issue going forward. So there's scope for a lot of collaborative opportunity that I think will be useful for the continent, and that's really improve brand China. Call me a little bit skeptical when you talk about fiscal transparency in the Chinese with their deals with African states and African leaders, where one of the big criticisms of the Chinese and how they do financing in Africa is the opacity that's there, the lack of transparency. And so I haven't seen any indication that they're going to be more transparent going forward, but it's certainly something to, to wish for. But I'm a little bit skeptical on that one. But you see, Eric, I feel like Xi Jinping is shifting a lot of things. I think he's doing a lot of stuff that people didn't expect. So one of the concerns okay. I've heard is, will Africa pay China back? I mean, this is a concern. They understand the political leverage that they get from that and how much they can leverage that. But at some point in time, these situations need to start making fiscal sense. And I think for China, they've played the long game of saying, OK, we'll be easy with the Africans. But I think this is an opportunity to change that. Because again, if you look at the public mood in Africa, if China does what Europe and North America have done, which is number one, keep us as raw material providers. And now if China continues to number two, allow governments to steal through their money, that sentiment that is xenophobic will grow on the continent. 
they know that there is a battle being waged for African minds, you know. So I am really watching China right now in terms of the narrative that they're going to pull, in terms of the sort of change, even in this development agency, how it will be structured, the type of financing it will deploy, what sectors it will focus on. So we're seeing a reimagination of China in Africa. And I think we should be at this point a bit open to the possibilities rather than using history, because I think history has taught us that if China can do anything, it adapts. Okay. Well, let's go on to our third and final point. And it's really been an important year with regards to the environment. If you recall back in January 1, 2018, China's landmark ban on the ivory trade went into effect. We're learning now that just because China banned the sale of ivory domestically is not necessarily stopping the illegal trade, as a lot of that trade has shifted to Laos and to Vietnam, which is now coming overland into China. But at least the Chinese government, from a policy point of view, a legal point of view, has implemented strong measures to contain the spread of illegal ivory in China. And more importantly, more in terms of West Africa, where ivory isn't the key issue, but fishing is a major issue, China finally now seems to be taking recognition of the fact that their long-distance fishing fleets are causing havoc in parts of the world, particularly off the coast of West Africa and down in the east off the coast of Mauritius. And so there is some indication that the Chinese are going to start taking action against the long-distance fishing fleet that are oftentimes fishing in international waters, but those are the same waters that local fishermen are going after as well. And through their mass fishing, they are depleting the stocks of fish, making it very, very difficult for fishermen in local communities on the west coast of Africa to survive. So it's an indication that environment is taking a higher priority in the policymaking process. And in Setsi, at the two sessions uh, forum, environment did come out to be a top policy priority and government priority. And you say that this, too, will have some profound implications for Africa. I mean, it's interesting what China is doing, because, you know, one of the things that really struck me in the two sessions is that when they were noting some of their accomplishments, the environment came up and they were like, you know, listen, we're going to do more and more to get our environment back. And I think there are two reasons that's happening. One is that the Chinese government knows that their environmentally unsustainable path can no longer happen. And they are very alive to the fact that the environment is crucial to the survival of them as a people. But the second thing that is really interesting about the environmental question is that there's a demand from Chinese people themselves to be more environmentally responsible. There's this demand that we cannot continue treating the environment as a casualty of economic development. So in Africa, we're really interested to see how brand China will change. Because as I alluded to earlier, one of the things we've seen in brand China in Africa is that, oh, these Chinese come in, they pollute our rivers, they log illegal logging, you know, they kill our animals, you know, they don't care about our environment. That's been a very strong narrative that's come out around the anti-China position in Africa. So we're really interested to see that with this newfound concern and really putting money behind their mouth and saying we're going to fix the environmental problems in China, can we see that being transferred in terms of the environmental standards to which not only government projects are held to, but even Chinese private sector is held to as they interact on the continent. So I think, again, that's an opportunity that Africa should leverage. I wonder how, you know, this is going to change thinking about African decision making, though, because so much of these kind of environmental scandals relating to China and Africa has, has so much African decision making kind of packed into them. I'm thinking, for example, about the coal-burning power plant that's being planned for Lamu, and, you know, for which China has been has received a lot of criticism. But, I mean, it's not like China, you know, had a gun to someone's head forcing them to build that plant in the first place or to make it a coal-burning plant. I mean, you know, those decisions are at least partially, you know, made in Africa. And Africa has not actually received that much criticism for those kind of decisions. Well, we are receiving. There are two big problems that we're having related to China and the environment. The first is what you're talking about, the coal plant. But you need to understand that that was a decision government made, as you're saying, is that government said, we have coal, we're going to use it. The end, you know. And there really was no conversation around it. Of course, we had a lot of environmentalists making all these arguments as to why it doesn't even make economic sense, but that doesn't seem to have gone anywhere. The second big issue is the, the railway through the national park. And again, China is the one building that railway, and there's been a lot of resistance from environmentalists around, you cannot put that sort of infrastructure in a national park that is not good for the animals or the earth. So those are the two big sort of sensitive points on the environment going on right now. And so I don't, just to be clear, I don't think this is stuff we're going to see immediately. As China is evolving into this new 
realm that is quite unfamiliar for many of us. I mean, it's familiar in some ways, but there are a lot of new things happening. The question for Africa is, how do we leverage these shifts? We cannot continue to just be subjects of either your American influence or Chinese influence. If we're seeing that China is being very serious about corruption, it is for the African people, either through NGOs or think tanks or public intellectuals or private sector to say, we expect those same standards to be applied when you come to do work on this continent. I don't see it as a problem. I see it as an opportunity to say, look at these shifts in China. Why don't we leverage them as Africans? So for me, that's where I'm coming from. Well, I know we have some listeners in the Chinese government in Beijing and at certain embassies around the continent. Let's hope they're listening to you, Enzatse, because I think you offer some very, very interesting advice to the Chinese. If everybody would like to check out Enzatse's article, you can find it over on her blog at enzatsewary.wordpress.com. We'll put a link in our show notes, and also you can go to Business Daily and look for shifts in China, Africa should watch. It's a fascinating look at three key points of recent domestic political developments here in China that will have some ramifications in Africa. And again, this is a relatively new phenomenon where domestic, uh, I mean, I, I can't say in the, in the 10 years that we've been covering this, where we've ever really felt that a lot of what happens in these political events have any effect. People keep their eye on FOCAC, which is the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, That's, of course, where China brings together all of Africa's leaders and hands out giant checks. Well, okay, well, that makes sense that Africa would be interested in that. We have one coming up in September. But so it's relatively new for me to kind of now see that people are watching these events in Beijing much the same way they might look at an American election and see what that would have as an impact there. So, and Setse, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. And if people want to follow what you're reading and writing, what's the best way for them to best stay in touch with you? Best way is Twitter. Just look for Anzetse and I'll come up. I have a Twitter handle and that's where I post all my work. So you'll find everything there. And- and Zetse is spelled A-N-Z or Z for you guys in South Africa, E-T-S-E. So there we go. So thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Kobus, it's fascinating that Nsetse is seeing these linkages on issues of corruption and environment that, to be honest with you, I didn't see. The key takeaways from the two sessions events recently in Beijing for me were obviously Xi Jinping's elimination of the term limits. That's what everybody talked about. And then secondly, the new development agency. So I think her taking it to that next level on anti-corruption and the environment was, uh, I thought was very interesting. I'm not sure I always agree with her optimism. I think that the Chinese sometimes, a lot of faith can be put into them and they have such a different agenda and a different way of doing things that it may not actually follow any type of prescription. So we just don't know what's going to happen and how the Chinese will engage. We'll get our first clue in September, I think, at the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation that will also happen in Beijing this year. If people recall, last time was in South Africa and there was a $60 billion financial package that was unveiled. Will that number go up? Or as you and I have been talking about for the past several months, Maybe the number will go down as China's trying to maybe diversify the relationship away from financial engagement to more diplomatic, military, humanitarian, aid. And so that will be our big indication. We'll get to see kind of whether or not Ntsetse's theories will play out. Yes, it's going to be very interesting. I mean, I think it's interesting how China is as you said, playing an increasingly larger and larger role in, you know, in African discussions in a similar way as the election cycle in the US does. And and in the process, I hope that Africa will slowly become more knowledgeable about China and be able to kind of read and decode China in more consistent ways. But that is a tall order. I mean, China is a lot more opaque than, you know, than, than other systems that put a lot of work into being transparent. China doesn't put a lot of work into being transparent. And And, you know, so China is a challenging political system to keep track of. And it'll be very interesting to see which particular themes play in Africa and which don't. Well, I really think that a lot of African policymakers need to brush up on understanding Chinese politics, in part because the relationship with the United States is going to change, whether they like it or not. Donald Trump appears to be shifting his national security team in profound ways. He is now with the new trade war that seems to be brewing with China. The protectionist wing of the Trump administration appears to be growing. 
So if I was a better, I wouldn't necessarily keep my bet on AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act that allows for free trade access from Africa into the United States. So the relationship with the U.S. may change, particularly as John Bolton, who is a very, very aggressive conservative right winger, now assumes the office of national security advisor. Everybody's expecting that he will push the United States to do more militarily. Certainly, Africa is on that agenda, as we saw with former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson's visit, where he talked about Muslim insurgencies in North Africa, and that's on the United States radar as well. So there's a lot at stake here to get right. And oftentimes, I find that still in African capitals, the level of awareness of China and Chinese politics and Chinese history is abysmally low. Yeah, what we need is a lot more university training in Asian studies in Africa in the first place. I mean, that is like, you know, the basic thing that that has to be gotten right at African universities. Well, hopefully a lot of our African listeners who are joining us for this program will take heed that there's a future in studying China because you'll probably have some job security. (laughs) That's the one thing I can probably say. Well, listen, that is our take on this issue. What do you think? We've got all of these different ways for you to communicate with us. Uh, One of the great ways is email. You can reach Cobus at cobus at chinaafricaproject.com. You can reach me at eric, E-R-I-C, at chinaafricaproject.com. I apologize. I've got about 15 students in particular from various countries who've emailed me. I've been very, very slow to get back just because I've been very, very busy, but I will get back to every single email because I really appreciate that people take the time to write me such thoughtful notes about their interest in China-Africa relations, papers that they're working on, even how to find jobs in the industry. And so I will give back a thoughtful response. It'll just be a little bit delayed. So Kobus and I, we have quite a few comments that we deal with and we try to answer everybody because we really appreciate and value our community so much. And speaking of our community, I just want to give a very, very warm welcome to Stephanie Ferrand, who is a master's candidate at Jiao Tong University here in Shanghai. She's originally from Johannesburg, and she is the new editor of our weekly email newsletter. And she also is very, very passionate about China-Africa relations, a South African native who is doing her master's degree here in China. She is well positioned to be editing our newsletter, and both Kobus and I are thrilled to have her on the team. So if you sign up for our newsletter, it is her handiwork, of course, edited by Kobus and myself every weekend, and it goes out every Monday. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. We'll be back again next week with another edition. Thank you so much for joining us. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Gwobas at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.